You've decided you want to learn art seriously. You're intrigued by the magical idea of creating illusions on paper. But art school is looking a little expensive nowadays, so you research online and you find some nice person has created a free self-guided art curriculum. And you've got some time on your hands, so you decide you'll give it a go. You start out by reading the Loomis Collection and decide to skim through the one book that no one actually really recommends reading. It has this diagram in it that helps things click, and you realize you should really start trying to understand perspective. So you watch some videos about learning perspective, like how to draw boxes and cylinders correctly. While taking the video course, you start reading Creative Perspective, and afterward you read Perspective Made Easy, and then you realize you probably should have read them in the opposite order, because Easy Perspective is easier than Creative Perspective. In creative perspective, you read that you should practice by drawing still life sketches of boxes, and you copy the lines accurately enough, but you still feel like you're not fully getting it yet, so you start the next part of your curriculum. But after doing all the reading and exercises, it feels like you're still missing some essential practical understanding of how to draw boxes freehand, and you actually end up calling it quits at box number 144 of the 250 box challenge it leaves you feeling a little deflated. You notice that a lot of your online art teachers encourage you to paint outdoors. At first you go outside and you can't seem to turn a corner without being reminded of your failure to finish the 250 box challenge. But you do see beautiful artwork around you and it inspires you to spend more time just drawing things that you see. And you complete a lot of plein air paintings and fall in love with art again because it feels like being alive. However, your attempts to draw boxes from imagination still look a little skewed, and you think maybe it's time now to really try and figure out how to draw boxes like a god. So you prepare yourself to draw boxes upon boxes again until you're pooped. So you draw many, 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 many boxes, and you start to make some connections between what you see on the page and what you saw outside on the streets, and you begin to piece it together. You form some rules in your head about how boxes work. It starts with an essential understanding that the lines you draw for the boxes depend entirely upon the relationship between two things. For one, the line of sight of the viewer, and two, the position of the box in space. When you think about your own line of sight, you remember that time you visited the record shop, and you wonder about how boxes would appear to you if they were somehow perfectly lined up in parallel rows and columns in front of you. And you realize your eye level always seems to land on the horizon line, and between your eyebrows seems to mark an invisible vertical line in front of you. And the intersection of these two lines creates a crosshair of your vision in front of you, which can be helpful for understanding how boxes appear in front of you. When you come to understand the position of the box, you learn that there's only really three positions that it can be in in relation to your line of sight. There's boxes where the face is facing nearest to you. There's boxes where the edge is facing nearest to you. And there's boxes where the corner is facing nearest to you. You start to explore the rules of these three box orientations further. The first type of box has its face facing you. So its front face is pointed directly at your eyes. And you can see its front face, but no others unless you're looking through it somehow. It's the most simple, perfect box to draw because it's just a square with all the corners pretty much at right angles. In our perfect wall of parallel boxes situation, it sits in the middle of your crosshair of vision. So you'll notice that it stretches above and below the horizon line and to the left and right of the vertical view line. This box orientation is usually seen right in front of you. and you use this basic face-facing box as a reference for the other two orientations. 
The second kind of box has its edge facing nearest you. You can see two faces of the box, which are either equal in size in a symmetrical view, or where one face is facing closer to you while the other is facing a little away from you. If you think back to your perfect parallel box wall situation, edge facing boxes only appear either on the horizon line or on the vertical view line above and below you. This is just the face facing box rotating sideways. So you start to see one of its side faces. And you realize a few things about how to draw the lines of this box. As the box rotates from face facing to edge facing, the two faces you see appear to change in width. As a face turns away from you, its width becomes smaller, while the face that starts turning towards you appears bigger. You recall your grade school understanding of angles, including right angles of 90 degrees, acute angles that are smaller than 90 degrees, and obtuse angles which are greater than 90 degrees. And you notice that these are helpful for understanding the appearance of edge-facing boxes. When you start from a face-facing box, all of the angles of the front face are perfect 90 degree right angles. But as the box rotates and that front face starts turning away from you, the angles next to the middle edge become less than 90 degrees or more acute, and the far angles on the outside edge of the box become greater than 90 degrees, more obtuse. This makes sense because the inner angles are closing in towards zero degrees and the outer angles are opening up towards 180 degrees as the face turns away out of your view. With the other side face that is rotating into your view, its corner angles do the opposite, where they become closer to the perfect right angle shown in a square until the box is once again face facing you with this new side. And not to get ahead of yourself, but you notice something peculiar about the length of the outside edges too. When one face is rotating out of you, its outside edge gets shorter. The opposite face that's rotating into view has an outside edge that gets taller, and it will continue to get taller until it meets the same height as the middle edge that was in front of you, turning the box into a perfect square, a front-facing box again. Also, you'd be amiss to forget that the edge-facing box doesn't always look perfectly vertical or horizontal. If it's rotated in space, the box might look like it's on a diagonal. The only thing that's important for an edge-facing box to exist is that its edge is facing you. The last box orientation is the corner-facing box. It's the most challenging to draw, but also the most rewarding once you start to get it right. It's hard to draw because you have to think about how much you can see of each of the three faces connected to the one corner that's facing you. This box is rotated in two ways from the original face-facing box. It's a little up or down and a little left or right. In the perfect wall of parallel boxes situation, corner facing boxes only appear above or below the horizon line and on either side of the vertical line of sight. You start to look at how this box rotates from an edge facing box into a corner facing box. If the top corner of an edge facing box lowers to face you, you start to see the top face of the box. If the bottom corner of an edge facing box rises to face you, you start to see the bottom face of the box. If the initial edge facing you is horizontally oriented and the box rotates away from you to the left, the right corner is facing closest to you and you start to see the right side of the box. And if the box rotates away from you to the right, the left corner starts facing you and you start to see the left side of the box. You start to notice this box orientation is all around you when you walk the streets of your city. And you become intrigued to notice the specific things that happen to the geometry of corner facing boxes as their orientation changes in space. Like when you look up from the horizon line at a stack of corner facing boxes, the one nearest to the horizon line has less of its bottom face showing than the box that is highest up above you. And now you seek to describe more of the math involved in drawing corner-facing boxes.
You notice how the angles of the box change as it shifts in orientation. There's 12 angles to keep track of on a corner facing box, four angles for each face. Knowing this, you come up with four easy rules for corner facing boxes. These six angles are always greater than 90 degrees or obtuse. These six angles are always less than 90 degrees or acute. And the angles around the corner that's facing you are less extreme or closer to a perfect square's 90 degrees than the angles around the edge of the box, which are more obtuse or more acute. Finally, whichever face of the box is closer to your view will be closer to a perfect square with 90 degree angles around it. And whichever faces of the box are oriented away from you, they will be more distorted with more extreme angles. So now you've drawn a lot of boxes and you start to meld your practical applied understanding with your learning from those earlier courses you took on perspective. And you notice that the three box orientations actually match up where the face facing boxes are in one point perspective, the edge facing boxes are in two point perspective, and the corner facing boxes are in three point perspective. So you've got your basic box drawing principles figured out. Things get a little more complex as you think about drawing through your boxes with x-ray vision. And you realize you want to figure out where the box's hidden faces, edges, and corners are when you can't see them on the opposite side of you. Every box includes three sets of four parallel lines. You normally think of parallel lines as always being perfectly distant from one another. When objects turn around in perspective, their parallel edges converge towards far away vanishing points. So in theory, the box is constructed of parallel lines, but in perspective, these parallel lines may converge. Actually, you realize how every box has three pairs of matching faces, and with those three pairs, three groups of four parallel edges that connect one face to another. When you draw through a face facing box, it's not too hard to figure out that the face farthest from you should also be square like the one that's facing you. The face facing box's edges include four parallel horizontal lines here and four parallel vertical lines here. If you wanted to, you could think of these parallel lines as going towards infinite vanishing points on either side and above and below the box, which are so perfectly far away that they cannot converge. In the face facing box, these four edges recede towards a vanishing point far away behind the box. When you draw through an edge facing box, you need to consider where the far edge is in relation to the one that's facing you. If the edge facing you is exactly in the middle with an equal view of two faces of the box, the far edge will be in the middle too, hidden behind the near facing edge. But if one face is rotated more into view, then the far edge will appear behind that face. Depending on how much of the face you see, the far edge will be either close to the midline or farther towards the side if you can see more of the prominent face. Edge facing boxes have one set of perfectly parallel lines and two sets of converging parallel lines that converge towards vanishing points on either side of the box. Finally, when you draw through the corner facing box again, you identify which face is the biggest or showing the most, and in that nearest facing face, you'll find the far corner. Sometimes this can be hard to do because the faces all appear kind of similar in size. If the near corner is smack dab in the middle of your line of sight, the far corner will be hidden behind it. Corner facing boxes have three sets of converging parallel lines usually two sets that go to either side of the box and one set that either converges underneath the box if you're looking down at it or above the box if you're looking up at it. And you really hope you haven't lost anyone at explaining these things yet. But you also just want to mention that in comparing each visible face of the box to its matching parallel far away side, you notice that the face you can see is obviously larger than the opposite one far away, just because it's closer to you, but the face you can see also has more distorted angles where its opposite partner is a little closer to a full perfect square with angles closer to 90 degrees. 
Okay, so you're pretty confident at drawing boxes now. With all your drawing practice, concepts start piling on top of the others and your understanding grows. But you allow yourself to keep asking questions because boxes don't always appear perfectly in rows in front of you. Although they might, usually they are rotated in random orientations all around you. Boxes might be nearby and huge with dramatic angles or far away and small, looking a little more earthbound. You're pretty sure this has something to do with the distance between vanishing points. Boxes might be near and far in the same image, impacting their apparent size. Some boxes aren't even true boxes, and some artists intentionally break the rules of perspective to tell their own stories. So you might still find drawing from imagination challenging, but you now know you can persevere to understand things and use your newfound skills and grit to make art that says whatever you want.